Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and start. And uh, again, using foundation of all good qualities to set our motivation and to really reinforce the stages of the path. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Cor correctly following the guru is the root of the path. By my clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon the guru with great respect. When I have discovered that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is extremely difficult to find again, and is greatly meaningful, please bless me to unceasingly generate the mind, taking its essence day and night. This body and life are changing like a water bubble. Remember how quickly they perish and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. When I have found definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be conscientious in abandoning even the slightest collection of shortcomings and in accomplishing all virtuous deeds. When I have recognized the shortcomings of samsaric perfections, there is no satisfaction in enjoying them. They are the door to all suffering and they cannot be trusted. Please bless me to generate a strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Through my being led by this pure thought, with great remembrance, alertness, and conscientiousness, please bless me to keeping the individual liberation vows, the root of the teachings, my essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so have all mother transmigratory beings. By my seeing this, please bless me to train in supreme bodhicitta, which bears the responsibility of freeing transmigratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta without familiarizing myself with the three types of morality, I cannot achieve enlightenment. By my seeing this well, please bless me to keep the vow of the sons of the victorious ones with fervent effort. By my having pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, Please bless me to quickly generate within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. When I have become a suitable vessel by training in the common path, please bless me immediately enter the holy gateway of the fortunate beings, the supreme of all vehicles, the Vajrayana. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping my vows and samayas purely. When I have gained effortless conviction in this, Please bless me to protect them even at the cost of my life. Then, when I have realized exactly the vital points of the two stages, the essence of the tantric sets, and I'm enjoying the yoga of four sessions with effort without being distracted by non-meditation objects, please bless me to accomplish these according to the teachings of the holy beings. Thus, may the virtuous friends who reveal the noble path and the spiritual practitioners who correctly accomplish it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely the collection of outer and inner obstacles. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus, may I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. And by completing the qualities of the grounds and paths, may I quickly attain the state of Vajradhara. Okay, so we are um, at this part in the Lam Rim, where we've looked at the root of the path, devotion to a spiritual guide, kind of in brief, and then we go to this part where we look at what to do in the meditation session, and they use this as kind of the launching off point for a further discussion about the guru. So they kind of use guru devotion as the example of how to do analytical and single pointed meditation. But uh, we go to this part on what to do in your meditation session, the preparatory rites, how to pursue the main part of the session, and what to do in the last part of the session. So these preparations are um, kind of important ways to get your mind ready to practice, and then how to pursue the main part of the session will be more about the spiritual guide. So this was where we get into the idea about devoting in thought, devoting in deeds, 
the advantages, et cetera, et cetera. So today we're just going to do a little bit about meditation sessions, which is pretty familiar to you guys, but we're going to go a little bit more in depth with these, which we've only kind of touched on briefly towards the beginning of your year. Before we get into that section about kind of structuring meditation and particular your own like personal daily practice, if you can just kind of click into what is my daily practice <laughs> and uh, what is the structure that I have, you know, maybe the structure you have on a good day and the structure you have on a day where you're very distracted and don't feel like it and the lack of structure on terrible days, whatever, but just kind of bring to mind your own practice right now on purpose and just think when I sit, what's the sequence of things I get up to? Yeah. What kind of time of day is it more most likely to happen? What makes me want to sit? What makes me not want to sit? Just, you know, you don't have to share it at all. Just really personally, what do you do on your cushion? How do you get there? And if you were to think about the steps before you start your practice, you know, the everyday kind of worldly steps, what are the most likely routines that will get you to the cushion? You know, the things that come before. Do you need to think about it a lot or is it better if you just spontaneously sit? Do you need refreshments beforehand or is it better on an empty stomach? Does it help to always sit in the same place or do you prefer to sit in a number of different places? So it's, it's important to kind of do that reflection every now and then, even if you've been practicing a long time, just asking yourself, what are the steps that get me there? And uh, what are the things that distract me if I'm like on my way to a sit and then I kind of detour suddenly? What creates a detour? How do I justify a detour? These kinds of things. Um, in the long rim, the way they explain preparing for a meditation session can sound very ritualistic, it can sound very religious, and but there's very good kind of psychology underneath it, which if you actually walk yourself through those steps, you wind up sitting more deeply. So as we go through the traditional kind of structure of the preliminaries before you get to the you're sitting, just ask yourself what that would look like for your life. It doesn't have to look the way it looks for me or the way it looks for hardcore Buddhists, you know, make it really personal to you, but ask like, what is my version of that that's practical and that might actually work? Because sometimes um, we have this push and pull relationship with our practice where we want to do it, but we have a little bit of aversion to it. We're hungry to do more. And then sometimes we overdo it and have a backlash. Um, sometimes we get into a really lovely routine and it's really consistent and smooth, but it can start to take an edge of laxity or dullness. You know, when you practice over a longer period of time, um, you start to see different I don't know, peaks and valleys in the connection you have to your sitting practice. So sometimes it's useful to go backwards and ask, how do I get to the cushion? And what do I do on the cushion before I actually start my session? You know, before I actually dive into whatever topic or practice it is I want to be doing, what's going to make my mind healthy and conducive and settled enough to dig in? So in your um, book, Practicing the Path, um, this section is explained in a lot of detail and I'll only read certain parts of it, but it starts on page 62. So the preparatory practices. So uh, Yangzi Rinpoche says in his commentary, 
Generally speaking, the preparatory practice are the basis upon which we create an environment conducive to meditation. Included within them are the activities of cleaning the meditation area, arranging pictures, objects, or statues of the objects of refuge, making offerings, arranging ourselves in the correct physical posture, and cultivating our motivation. Once we have cultivated our motivation, we then take refuge, generate the mind of enlightenment, and practice the seven limbs in order to accumulate merit and purify negative karma. So the best form of cleanliness is that of a mind cleansed of the eight worldly concerns. So, you know, whether you literally clean your space, which is a good idea, even if it's just a simple version, mentally is the more important thing. So you're just really consciously looking at, is my reason for meditation at all wrapped up in the eight worldly concerns? And it might be. You know, it might be that you want to relieve the immediate stress of this day only, or it might be that you want the people in your household to be impressed with you meditating, or, you know, you might want something kind of worldly in the back of your mind. And so you bring that to the surface, acknowledge it, and then consciously readjust to altruism. So that's an important piece there. Then we talk about the meditation seat, and we've talked about this a lot, which is basically the seven point posture of Arachana Buddha, the embodiment of the purified form aggregate. So basically sitting upright. And this straightens the channel within the body. So the energy flow, wind flows more freely and the mind is clear, creating a conducive internal and external condition for meditation. So among the seven points, the most important is the arrow straight back. And I know that, you know, sometimes we have health things and we need to rely on the back of the wall. Um, I think it's worth, even if you've been relying on a chair or the back of the wall for a long time, to sometimes try and sit unsupported and see if you can rearrange things under your tailbone so that your back becomes self-supporting. You know, I, I myself have a lot of back problems and pain and stuff, but if I get the cushion set just right under my tailbone, it's actually easier to sit straight without the back of the wall. It's, um, it's counterintuitive. It feels like you kind of need the, the wall to help you. But actually, um, if you can find that spot, just the, the back of your rear end slightly raised, and then the rest of it going down. You might need little cushions under your ankle bones if your ankle bones are very bony, or you might need a little support under your knees. But the main thing is kind of getting that tailbone, something firm, but not too hard so that you can sit unsupported. And really nice straight back, shoulders down, you know, tuck the chin in. And it's so simple, but it makes such a difference to how well you're able to focus and how likely you are to fall asleep. So, um, so if that's a project that you've kind of put to the back burner, maybe just gently bring it back, even for just short sessions, sitting up straight unsupported. And once you're seated, we visualize the merit field in the space in front of you with Guru Shakyamuni Buddha at the center. To his left and right, are the lineage lamas of the profound path of wisdom, the extensive path of method, the entourage of the direct and indirect lineage gurus. They are further surrounded by Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, meditation deities, and so forth. This field of merit is unlike ordinary fields where you can harvest crops just once or twice at limited times of the year. In this field, you can harvest the fruit of merit at all times and in every direction. So um, this point down here is nice for something to be considered an assembled field of merit. It doesn't necessarily need to be composed of holy objects alone. In general, as long as there are sentient beings, it can qualify it as a field of merit. So it's anything that moves your mind towards Dharma. So the traditional one, you know, is really elaborate. Some of you might have seen it, but this is the traditional Geluk merit field, which has the Buddha in the heart of Lama Tsongkhapa. I don't know if you can see that. So there's, <clears throat> here's Lama Tsongkhapa, 
And at his heart is Shakyamuni Buddha. And at the heart of Shakyamuni Buddha is Vajadhara. So the tantric emanation of Shakyamuni Buddha. So you have kind of secret Buddha, historical Buddha, and then kind of our direct connection to Buddha like that, and then expanding and zooming out. So one side, the left side is the wisdom lineage. The right side is the method lineage. Down here, we have meditational deities, yogis, protectors, all those kind of folks. And for someone who is very engaged with the history and lineage of Buddhism, who has a lot of traditional gurus, this image is very inspiring. Even if we don't know absolutely every single figure in here, we probably know a handful on either side, a handful up here. Most of these guys, lots of these guys, and these, you know, most of us have kind of a working knowledge of at least half of this merit field and that's enough and basically it's just kind of a reassurance and a connection that this path has been done before you know there are people who have become buddhas since shakyamuni buddha and you know he can connect us to then the heart of the practice lama Tsongkhapa, who kind of pulls it all together for us so there's a tradition of many into one or one into many. So you can think that Lama Tsongkhapa or Shakyamuni Buddha represents and embodies all of them, or that from Lama Tsongkhapa or Shakyamuni Buddha, all of them emanate. And this ties back into the idea of the guru being one in nature with all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, one in nature with all holy beings. So to visualize a merit field, it's somewhere to make offerings towards in order to generate more momentum for yourself. And it helps you lift the mind and inspire the mind. This stage is probably, I don't know, maybe the most religious sounding, but in a lot of ways is far more historical and scholarly because you're realizing that this is a valid path with a valid source and an unbroken continuity that you can rely on. This isn't just something one person tested and liked. This is a system that many people have tested and achieved the result of. So it's very uplifting for the mind. Um, but what do you guys think when you see that massive merit field with all of those Buddhas and all those historical figures and just the idea of, you know, once you clean the space, you sit down and visualize all the Buddhas are there. Even if you just think Shakyamuni Buddha, who's like representative of all of them. Is it effective for your mind? Is it distracting? You know that I'm forever doing deity meditations and then saying, but you can adjust it to just light, you know, to try and be accommodating. But the, the shape, size, hand gestures, colors, these are all, you know, really important symbolism that has an effect on our mind, even before we understand the symbolism. You know, there can be a really great benefit in thinking of these images because they came from the enlightened mind, but it can be triggering. You know, some people feel like it's, I don't know, idolatry or something, and it's not, of course, but, um, we haven't really talked about it very much, how many of you actually feel comfortable visualizing a literal Buddha and how many of you really need to rely on just light because otherwise it's too triggering. I can say that uh, for me, it's, um, it's something that I still, uh, I'm still trying to find uh, for, uh, in, in the practice because my tendency is, uh, is not to the to to imagine or to have kind of something that feels to me concrete or imaginable. Or I, I uh, so I know I know it's something uh, to to aspire to. I know it's it, it would be a development uh, for for my practice, but um, it's it's not quite there yet. <laughs> Or... It's not natural for me. Yeah. It's, not, it's not my tendency. My tendency is more is more to uh, to to something. Um, how would I say it? The opposite of concrete. Now, um, yeah, like spacious or something. Uh, 
to, to I know I know it's not an opposite. I know it's also a gate to emptiness, but but uh, it feels like it's it it encodes me in 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 forms and shapes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's I, I hear you, and I you know I sometimes have that, especially when I look at that specific gelukpa tree i i also you know part of me notices that it's 99 male figures which is a thing um and you know and that's because it, in the cultures that buddhism has entered into uh buddha manifesting as a woman wouldn't have been listened to and so they had to manifest as men in order to be heard <laughs> And, you know, the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas is genderless and genderful and none of that is really a thing. And, you know, but I can too get lost in form of a certain type and have some sort of resistance like that. And then, you know, I often think of that Thich Nhat Hanh quote about form is empty, emptiness is form. He says, think of form is like the wave and emptiness is like the water. And so, you know, a wave has shape but it's still of the same nature as water. You know, it's not different to water, but to have shape means that our relative mind has something to relate to. And our relative mind needs something to relate to that's in some way personified. And if it doesn't, it can get too abstract and too disconnected, I think. Um, so it's a stepping stone, even though it's not the ultimate but it somehow is taking us beyond where we are, even if it's not the final. I, I wonder, um, maybe I find myself influenced by the idea of, uh, uh, you know, in uh, Judaism, it says don't make a sculpture and an image. Well, yeah. I'm not religion, uh, obviously, but still the beginning of monotheism was to give up the concrete uh, form of uh, God. And then I think I find a kind of uh, reaction to, to the idea of a sculpture, although I know it's yeah. a symbol and, but it's interesting how I find, uh, I find myself being a little bit uh, embarrassed by the idea of, imagine a concrete image mm. yeah yeah and we we use that same teaching in christianity you know it's almost it is a similar idea i think that you know god or the divine is formless so that means it can take any form you know we go a step further in a way of saying sure the dharmakaya mind of all the buddhas is formless but then it can choose to take the sambhogakaya image of this or this or this or this and by making these archetypes it directs our mind more precisely to the job that we're working on in that practice so if the dharmakaya takes the shape of tara who embodies the archetypal qualities of a protective mother who is ready to leap to the aid of sentient beings then my mind pulls up those qualities within myself and nurtures those qualities within myself and invites support from the outside world that is of that energetic type but then it can just dissolve back into the dharmakaya and take the form of you know yamantaka or whatever you know, so it's almost like the Buddha can be as anything. So now I shall look at it in this way, <laughs> you know, because of what it does for my mind. But yeah, it can be, it can be a little bit triggering and it can be the sort of thing you want to keep private, you know, if your friends and family don't really understand, you know, some cultures, they go the other extreme and they put their Buddha pictures everywhere, all around the house, you know, like above the fireplace, like it's just art. And that's also not ideal, you know, because it's not art. <laughs> you know, it's art, but it's not art. It's a meditation tool. Yeah, and then there was a question in the chat, um, not triggering, but problems visualizing. And, um, you know, that's definitely a thing if you have aphantasia, aphantasia, what is it called? Whenever it is that you can't visualize, it's some sort of um, 
you know, some percentage of the population just can't visualize. You say, think of your mother's face and they think of their mother's qualities and the feeling of being with them, but they can't picture their face. So some people just don't visualize well and that's no problem at all. The main thing is you're bringing up the idea of invitation and connection and their presence. You know, you're inviting them, you're connecting with them, and you think that they're actually there. Then if you can visually see even just the Buddha, that's excellent, but it's not the main thing. Yeah. Um, I'd like to connect it to something that we heard um, last uh, um, in, in the seminar that we had a minute ago, some minutes ago, where I can think about this, uh, what we saw is really as a, um, the Buddha in the heart of Lama Tsongkhapa is, is like is idealizing self-object. And as Trozier was just telling us about uh, a, a, a patient, the part of uh, the way he was cured, part of it was that he draw himself and in, in his eyes, there was the picture of his analyst. As he had to in his eyes, uh, reflect the eyes, the, the, the presence of the psychoanalyst as an idealizing self object. So I think that if we can just uh, uh, further on uh, develop the concept, um, it's more, uh, we're more, more close to the, the sense of what this picture that you showed us than we think. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And, you know, and before we start a lot of pujas, you know, we say visualize the merit field and the chanting leader might say visualize many into one <laughs> and just, you know, you have this grand, huge map of all these Buddhas and they all go <laughs> into the one central one, you know, and one in nature, one taste like this. Yeah. Um, Lama Zopa Rinpoche is, is famous for saying if anything moves your heart, towards the dharma you put it in the merit field even if it's a kangaroo you put it in the merit field um, if it's your kindergarten teacher who taught you the alphabet put her in the merit field if it's someone who helped you understand art and music and that made you enjoy life more deeply put them in the merit field so there's that little um circle underneath lama Tsongkhapa where you have lama Tsongkhapa repeated here and here is where you can add your own root guru and any other teachers you might have kind of all in this little area here, surrounded by the highest yoga tantra deities. So um, that's where they go. <laughs> but you can also just think of them. You could just think Buddha, kindergarten teacher, random kangaroo, you know, <laughs> it can be your own merit field, you know, it doesn't have to be this exact structure. It's helpful to think of a connection with both method and wisdom. So teachers that for you evoke an understanding of emptiness, teachers for you that evoke a sense of those heart-centered method practices, you know, it's good to have those two bundles, but uh, however they look to you. I think also that even if it is not in the terminology of Buddhism, but uh, in the terminology of human mind, also the aesthetic channel is an important one the aesthetic way to relate to something with it, which is higher than ourselves and we see it in all, all traditions and it is a way to become one with. Yeah. And I think, for example, when I see this image, I think that it's simply beautiful. <laughs> and, and this is a kind of beauty which uh, touches the, 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 the mind and the heart and makes us feeling one with many, many other others. So they are Buddha, but they are also other human beings and all other beings. And there is something in it, which is. Yeah, and you know, it, it's conditioning the eye sense power and the eye sense consciousness to direct towards things that bring out the best in us rather than things that make us chase more, you know, sites to entertain rather than making the mind hungry. You know, it's like, again, using our senses for our path rather than having some sort of battle with them. Uh, Iris or Ronan, did you have something? 
Yeah, for me, it's something very simple. I, sometimes I look at it as I uh, open a, an old uh, box of photographs from my family a few generations ago. I, I, I look at it as if it was a family photograph, a karmic family. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not deities for me, they are real figures, uh, not in the sense of concrete ones, but of some of the, the face, the real face in the capability of the human mind to transform to these highest uh, levels of, uh, of enlightenment and realization. So for me, it's an evident, it's a lively evident of, of this capability. Yeah, yeah, I think similarly, or like they're my old friends, there's all my old friends and they're, you know, cheering me on to join them <laughs> and uh they are they are deities they are enlightened but they are also human beings that existed and had their struggles and their triumphs just like everyone else you know these are relatable figures all of whom have a life story that you can read a bit read about and it really uplifts the mind and the years go by and it more and more is like oh my old friends you know or my family yeah so it's a thing that happens, um, take it or leave it. <laughs> um, then we have the seven limb practice. And we've talked about this briefly, not in huge amounts of depth, but you know, this is what you do. Again, you're not even doing your meditation practice yet. You're doing your preliminaries to make your mind want to meditate and to be inspired to meditate. And so you do prostration either from your seat, just with your two hands together, or before you sit down full length or half length prostrations and they purify the obstacles of our negative karma and thereby enable us to accumulate merit prostrations can be physical verbal or mental basically physically any physical gesture that we make as a demonstration of respect is a form of physical prostration so it can be formally two hands together, but it can also be anything that from our side is a respectful gesture. And when you do this in a practice setting, you visualize that your own body replicates and you know uh, multiplies, equaling the number of atoms in this world emanating from us. And we imagine a complete field of merit before each one of them to which they prostrate. And so this is really a lot for the mind, um, but it can be actually really absorbing and really inspiring. You can think all of these versions of me are maybe myself and all of my past lives prostrating to merit fields. And this can really maximize the mental energy and the merit that you create. It can also help the mind be very absorbed. And then reciting prayers of praise and admiration is the verbal form of prostration. So I thought to talk just briefly about this physical two hands together version that we do in Buddhism. So we have our little thumbs inside and then we go like this. So like that. And the two thumbs folded into the hollow, the shape of the outside of the hands symbolizes the form of a Buddha and the shape of the inside represents the truth body or the Dharmakaya of a Buddha. In its entirety, this hand gesture symbolizes that our ultimate goal is to achieve the two bodies of the Buddha. The two bodies, which can then be elaborated into three or four, but you know, the ones related to the wisdom side and the ones related to the method side. So when you're doing this, you're saying basically, this is what I want, <laughs> you know, the result. And you're kind of acknowledging the result in front of you, but you're also acknowledging the result growing within you. It's a mutual gesture of respect. It's respect to yourself. It's respect to your potential. It's respect to those who embody your potential. It's not just, I am low, you are high. It's this idea of you become receptive to what you respect. So um, usually we think with my body, <laughs> speech, and mind, I prostrate to the three jewels. So body is, you know, crown, forehead, then speech, throat chakra, then mind, heart chakra. 
those being the seats of those various things. Um, any questions or ideas about prostration? It's something we've, we've talked about before. It is an antidote to pride, but it's not an encouragement or an invitation to humiliation or being subservient or something. It's, it's quite a powerful practice, but it can be a little bit triggering. <laughs> Anything you wanted to unpack about prostrating? No, no, I just want to say that I think as, as for me, I'm not taking this as prostration, but maybe it is, I'm studying now that it is, and I'm okay with it uh, totally. But I think the prostration when you are lying, you know, uh, underneath the, the tank also, it seems to me that it expressed the, a slight difference between belief and inspiration. And I think for as a secular people, uh, while inspiration is something that you want to absorb and you want to develop through, a belief, it's a more challenging, it's something deeper, it's something that it takes long time, you have to study very deeply and you have to, to deal with it. What are your beliefs talking about? Uh, karma and future lives, etc., etc. It's, it's a deep thing. It's not something that you can do just like that. While, you know, doing this is really comes from the heart and it seems quite modest and this is respectfulness or something like this. Just something that I think. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, just, uh, you know, logistically, this one is just like, hello, <laughs> or hello, I like you, I'm happy to see you, but you know, your palms, you know, it's just a greeting. When you put your thumbs in and create this form, this becomes, you know, kind of the Buddhist prostration. So probably people can't tell from looking at you which one you're doing, thumbs in, thumbs out. But um, when you're offering a real prostration, it is, as you say, there's, there's a level of belief, but it's almost like belief with gratitude. You know, there's, there's times in my life where I have to think to myself, make the prostration mudra, it's polite. <laughs> and there are times in my life where I spontaneously put my hands together. And it's from this deep kind of like gratitude belief. And it's, it's a gratitude that so far this path has worked out really well for me. And I would be a very different person if I'd never met it. And I'm much better for it. And I'm much happier and more contented for it. And it's almost just like a wave of gratitude, respect, which is what belief feels like to me. You know, it's a gratitude, respect mixture. So, you know, sometimes it's a be polite, prostrate, there's a geshe coming. And sometimes it's, oh my gosh, thank you. This is what I want to be when I grow up. And I'm so much more on the path because of you. Thank you. You know can be many things at once. Um, you know, when it's alone in my house with my altar, it's, you know, there's a lot of thoughts to get me into it being authentic and not being contrived, but it sometimes has to start contrived before it can become authentic. And really what that means is focused because it's not really contrived because I actually do believe in these things, but sometimes it takes a few minutes to click back into the depth of my thoughts about it. It's an interesting practice, you know, in retreat, we often do 15 minutes of prostration before every session, before we sit down, it's quite a common thing. The all the way down, all the way up, all the way down, all the way up. It's like a very fast sun salutation, right? So it's good energetically, of course, just for your body to move before you sit down and meditate. Just logistically, it really helps to have been moving and then sit down, your circulation is happier with you. But it's also like, you're in the mood to listen deeply to the practice because you've spent 15 minutes hitting the floor and really thinking about how much we aspire to. It's, it's an interesting thing, but the main prostration is of course mental. So you can have secret mental prostrations even if you're too embarrassed to do physical or verbal prostrations <laughs> and it can still have this effect of absorbing you into this listening aspect so that you listen with more of your depth and more of your deep wisdom. So you can read that whole section um, in practicing the path if you're curious, but I thought to just give you a little summary here. So basically 
the first of the six preparatory practice is cleaning the meditation space, basically being free from the eight worldly concerns, but actually physically doing something that's cleansing, it actually does lift the space, even if it's just kind of a symbolic dust this or put away that, it does help the mind. And then arranging representations of your path. We have kind of a traditional look that a an altar might have. I'll show you mine. Let's see. Um, you guys have seen this behind me in our meditations. But basically you have representations of the Dharma are the Buddha's speech, and that's your texts, and they go on the right-hand side of your altar, representing method and speech. Then you have a stupa on the left-hand side of your altar, representing the enlightened mind, the wisdom side of the path, and um, the Buddha's holy mind. And then in the center, you have Shakyamuni Buddha, I have many Shakyamuni Buddhas. You do not need to have excessive Shakyamuni Buddhas. I just am out of control. But um, that represents the enlightened body or the form. And then you might have some deities that you have particular connection with. There's Tara and Chenrezig. And over here, you can't see there's a medicine Buddha. There's some eight auspicious signs, that kind of thing. And above the deities, you have your teachers because the the teachers, the gurus, are the Buddha for you. You know, it's like there's the Buddhas, but then the Buddha for you are these people that are the mouthpiece of it. And so they go higher. And, um, you know, if you're being technical, you put, you know, higher gurus above lower gurus. And all of that is just kind of stuff in your own mind that can kind of help you connect. You don't really have to do it that way. But um, that's the way it would go <laughs> were you to do it. So His Holiness up at the top. Then I have my teacher, Kensa Rinpoche Geshe Tashi Sering, and his teacher, Chudin Rinpoche, and His Holiness and Kensa Rinpoche together. And then under is Lama Zopa Rinpoche, and under him is Geshe Wangchen. And those are my main teachers, and um, makes me happy to see them. So a simple altar would just have like some texts, a Buddha, a stupa. And you see, I've kind of repeated this pattern, you know, I've got Buddha texts, <laughs> stupa, you know, Buddha text, stupa, I have it repeated, you don't need to be so elaborate. But then you make offerings, which is something that is beautiful for you. You know, so some days it's just like a bowl of grapes, you know, or some candles. Some days, you know, I get elaborate and I find roses and put them there. It doesn't have to be anything special. Every day I do I try to do water bowls, sometimes with saffron, sometimes without, but it should be something that is precious to you and ethically obtained. So, you know, th these are things that they are not necessary. You don't have to have them, but if there's a place in your house where you always practice that have images that you can see with your eyes that remind you of your path, and then you make some sort of symbolic offering. It can be just one flower from your garden. You know, it, it does prepare the space. It creates a sacred space. Any space can be sacred, but we have to bring some intention to it for it to feel that way. And if you bring intention to a space consistently enough, it starts to feel sacred even when you haven't thought about it yet. You know, the way a really old synagogue or a really old church or a really old temple feels sacred when you walk into it. Maybe different than a brand new one with all sorts of shiny, beautiful things. It might not feel like it's really matured yet, <laughs> you know? And so a space gets imbued with the minds who are in it, doesn't it, you know? And the minds that didn't get invited to it, it gets imbued by that. You know, we know if we visit people in a prison, it's a little unsettling, even before we've gone through gates or seen troubled people. There's a feeling in a prison like bad thoughts have happened here a lot. <laughs> you know, it has an effect. So um, we can create these kind of sacred spaces and it will help, it really will help. People that do long retreat try to do retreat somewhere someone else has done retreat first. It's, it's a lot easier. You kind of ride the wave of someone else's practice in a way. And um, 
personally, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but for me, it's a lot easier to settle down in India, even though India is chaotic and noisy. It's just easier to just straight into the practice, far less distractions, because a lot of practice happens there. So I don't know, thoughts on that? Does it feel logical or superstitious or how does it sound? to arrange representations of your path and to make offerings to them. It sounds uh, inspiring. Um, I can really see how, how it is inspiring. Um, I'm not sure if it's the right inspiration for me, um, but I wish it, I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> Because it seems um, with, with a lot of space in it or uh, openness in it, um, which I can't at this point uh, get. Uh, maybe it's because of my secular uh, education or uh, um, I try to visualize uh, the Buddha figure when, when you lead a meditation, but I, I feel like I miss so many details because it's not really um, written in my head. Mm. Um, so I, I use it uh, very abstractively. I'm, I'm not trying to, to imagine the specifics because I can't. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It would only take my attention away instead of making me concentrate. So I use a, an abstract uh, image, mm. uh, and sometimes I feel like it's it's helping me be at I don't know at the range of concentration at least. Um, and I wish it was my thing to do the altar. <laughs> Because I feel like it can really help, and I think we know it from from other uh, things. I have a, a postcard that I bought in in Ford's house in London, I posted inside my uh, I don't know uh, cupboard. Mm. So everyone has this, this image, or uh, and uh, even even at the earlier lesson when we saw uh, Stozier who. Uh, was with code it was kind of uh inspiring although he's a man and he's not code <laughs> and, <even, laughs> and even if he were so so i think we all got our own little things that inspire us and but yeah and i, I mean I've, I've known some people who sometimes have a picture of their sangha you know like maybe even with them with their sangha because for them that is a, a more direct refuge you know and it's just like a regular photograph you know with some of their teachers some of their peers some of themselves and just looking at it before they sit down reminds them of retreats they've done together and reminds them of things they've connected to you know and just it's kind of a, a secret sacred space it might just look like a holiday picture but it's for them that's their their sacred space you know or your sometimes grandmother ask, or whoever, you know. Sometimes I ask myself, and I wanted to ask you, how don't we make it uh, an attachment object? How don't we make it an, an habit? How do we keep it a door to inspiration and not the thing itself? I think just knowing that, I think knowing that is prevents it, you know. I, uh, I, the picture of his holiness reminds me of his holiness. I can connect to his holiness through it. But if I don't have that picture of his holiness, I have a picture of his holiness in my head, <laughs> you know, or I have a picture of him in my prayer books or I have, you know, it's like, I, I don't need it. It just helps, you know, I don't need it. It just helps. Um, when I'm traveling, I have like tiny version you know, um, you know, just very tiny and then like little tiny picture and then, you know, put little tiny flower and it's sort of sweet. And um, 
if I am walking in the woods and I suddenly feel like I think I should do some practice, I also can just sit on a log and do my practice and there's just trees, <laughs> you know. So it's, you know, I just have to remind myself, especially if I'm getting materialistic, because of course, you know, you might think I would love a beautiful picture of Tara. And then you go look on a website and you're like, oh, that one has gold. Oh, that one has many flowers. And you can get like materialistic about it, which is really unfortunate, but very human, you know, and very normal. And we don't want to be rating them. You know, like that's a good Tara, that's a bad Tara. We could say the artist was more skillful with that one and less skillful with that one, but Tara is always perfect, you know. So um, sometimes I even um, have images that are not my favorite artist because it helps me remember that the art is not the point. The essence is the point. Sometimes that can help. I know um, Chodron has on one of her altars, this Buddha statue she found, I don't know, somewhere in the seventies or something. And it was really strangely made out of rock and she just liked it at the time. And it's just like, not what you would think to get, <laughs> but it makes her so happy because of the connection she has with it. So it's not about, you know, the beauty of the thing. It's about what it reminds you of, but yeah. Fundamentalist, fundamentalism is prevented by remembering emptiness and dependent arising, I guess is the short version. <laughs> if you remember emptiness and dependent arising, you don't get weird about it. Um, you know, so we get that set up. And then when you do offerings, it creates positive karma. It creates a habit of generosity. It just gets you into an offering headspace when you're in your daily life, you're more spontaneously generous if you already have this habit happening. But it's similar to prostration where we become receptive to things we engage with. So this offering one, and it comes up again in the seven limb prayer, making offerings, I think it's a really important thing for us to think about because for example, we always make a financial offering when we request a teaching and the teacher might keep it if they need it. They might not keep it. They might give it back to you. They might give it to another charity. It's not really about what the teacher needs, although hopefully you support all your teachers, but it's about if you contribute or invest in something, you're more proactive in engaging with it. You know, and I was thinking about this with them. Um, my father has a lot of low income people on his, in his um, therapy practice. And he insists that even the poorest people give him something, even if it's just like carrots from their garden, or like a flower, or, you know, a cup of coffee, because they are more invested in the process, if they've invested something. You know, this psychology or like if you've given something to it, you're much more engaged with it. If, for example, we're successful in getting His Holiness to teach Israel, and we're part of making that happen through making offerings of our time and our energy, whatever topic he teaches, I think is going to have a lot more meaning for us than when he's teaching live all the time and we watch him all the time. Hopefully it goes quite deeply then too, but you know, it will have that extra connection because we've invested time and energy and resources into it. So it's again, the Buddhas don't need your offerings, the gurus don't need your offerings in that kind of literal sense. It's about what it does to your mind to not be passive. Thoughts? Because of course the Buddhas are helping whether you make them offerings or not. They're helping all the time. However, our engagement with their help, what makes us engage with their help? That's the question. Yeah. So, you know, if you've done a whole song and dance with your altar and made it all beautiful and lovely and put water bowls and flowers and then don't sit, you feel kind of silly, <laughs> like you got all ready to sit and then you didn't sit and, you know, and the Buddhas are like, you know, tapping their fingers like, are you coming or what? <laughs> you know, you invited them. Yeah. So anyway, these are, these are interesting tools and you think of what's going to work for you. But uh, the, really, I want us to hear that um, having a preliminary 
is, is very, very useful for actually sinking in to the practice itself. So then you arrange your seat and you set your motivation, but of course you're gonna set your, motion, your motivation again and again and re-visualize, do the seven limbs, request for blessings, and then from there you do your practice. So that whole section is in um, practicing the path if you wanna kind of look into the more of the details of it. But um, I think that it's, you know, it's intellectually quite easy to understand. So if you just wanna clarify bits, it's easy enough to look up. And um, we'll probably leave that topic for now. Um, and you can send me questions if you have questions about it, but probably I'm guessing it's clear enough. Um, so we'll go ahead and dedicate. Oge wadi nyuruda lama sange drugyune droa chinga malu pa de salagu pa sho. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. Okay, thanks guys.